Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great webinar from CPAacademy.org. My name is Jasmine, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's course, Multi-State Taxes and Nexus Issues in a Post-Wayfair World. Today's presenters are Benjamin Klugent and Maggie Crowley. I'll be turning it over to them in just a moment. But before we get started, I just want to make sure everything's working for our audience. So if you haven't already, head on over to the questions panel on your GoToWebinar control panel. Pop that box open and type me a quick message to let me know that you can hear my voice and see that title slide up on screen. You also should be seeing our three webcams for the moment. Also, feel free to let me know where in the world you're tuning in from today. I'm seeing April in Ohio, Dallas, Buffalo, New York, Denver, Colorado. I see Texas, Arroyo Grande, California, Las Vegas. Wow, we've got a big group today. I want to thank you all for tuning in and thank you for confirming. Now, this questions box is going to be used in a couple of different ways today. As you come up with questions or comments about the presentation, you can leave those there. We'll do our best to get around to you all during today's presentation. But if we don't address your question in our time, don't worry. We'll be sure to send that over to our panel in a full report. Also, if at any point you run into technical trouble, you can drop me a note right there in that questions box and I'll get around to you as quickly as I can and get you back on track. All right, now that we know how to use that questions box, let's go through a little housekeeping regarding your credit. This webinar qualifies for one CPE credit. To earn that credit, stay logged in with us for at least 50 minutes of our allotted time. That's five zero minutes and respond to our polling questions. We will announce and launch a total of five polls today. And for the best experience, I encourage you answer as many polls as you can and as quickly as possible. Now we are recording today's session and that archive as well as your CPE credit will be available in your CPA Academy accounts within 24 hours. We also recommend that you go ahead and grab a copy of today's presentation materials. I'll be sending over a newly updated handout in just a moment, so be on the lookout for that. I think we're all set now, so please join me in welcoming our first presenter. Maggie, our attendees are ready and the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Jasmine, and thank you to everyone who's attending our webinar today. Um, I think you can see our pictures on the next slide, Ben, if you don't mind navigating to that. I am Maggie Crowley, Head of Strategic Development for Layton. Layton is a global tax consulting firm, so we help both businesses and CPAs simplify access to complex tax credits and complex tax strategies. So today we'll be talking about one of the most complex strategies and that is state and local tax. We've seen so many changes um, to, to state and local tax as a result of the Wayfair decision, but also through COVID. I mean, COVID changed the landscape of, of so many things, including business. So today we're we're here to discuss that and provide you with an education on what you need to know and how you can get there, um, hopefully with the help of Layton. And we, we do spend um, a lot of time partnering with CPAs. That is my function and responsibility here at Layton. So we look forward to educating you. We will be dropping a link in the question box for you to schedule time to speak with one of our experts here at Layton. If you have any questions about um, state and local tax, or if you have questions about the other products that we offer, ERC, research and development and energy efficiency products. So leading the show today is Ben Kluwin. And Ben is here from, he's actually been kind enough to take some time out of his vacation in South Africa. So Ben, thank you. What time is it there? Uh, it's uh, time to get started on a salt presentation. I think it's uh, eight oh five p.m. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, thanks for spending your your post dinner evening with us. No um, worries at all. And just to confirm, you're running the slides, correct, Ben? Yeah, correct. Okay, so the next slide is just a, a picture of you and I. Um, Sorry, one moment. There we go. Um, so I think it'd be great to start, Ben, by learning a little bit about about you, and then we can get right into this salty education. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you, Maggie. And I had noticed you, you had asked me to change the slide, but it, it was on it was on pause. So I'm I'm confirming now they're moving. Awesome. Can you see yes, it moving? Good. Yes. Excellent. Uh -huh. Perfect. So um, thank you very much for that introduction, Maggie. And uh, it's great to be online with uh, all, all of the CPAs uh, to, today. Um, so I'm Ben or Benjamin, but I'm commonly known as Ben. And I work at Leighton um, across a number of um, incentives that we offer, but more recently, a big focus of mine has been our SALT consultancy, where SALT or state and local tax uh, is in, uh, it's being, it has been dubbed as the most up and coming area of public accounting. Um, you know, where the United States, uh, all 50 states plus DC, I'm sure you are all aware as CPAs that there are so many complexities uh, I, my background, as you can hear from, from my accent, I'm from Australia, and in Australia we had complexities with the various states, but when you throw this level of jurisdictions and this level of uh, townships and parishes, I mean, it's just a different world. And because of that, especially as Maggie said, since Wayfair and since COVID, we're seeing so many businesses just lost when it comes to developing a state and local tax strategy. And what's really interesting, and the reason why I think today's presentation will be of particular relevance to all of you, I should note it is going to be quite content heavy. We're going to be talking quite a little bit about the technical nuances of what nexus means when it comes to state and local tax, what physical presence is, what economic nexus is, and the changes that have taken place, and try to give you a bit of an upskilling for those who don't know much about it, and for those who do, to give you a bit of a refresher. And the idea is, if you can sort of picture a business that works across multiple state lines, I like to ask them sort of three key questions. The first question is, uh, are they operating across multiple state lines? And we define operating by the words, by concepts like having employees or having an office or storing inventory or traveling for trade shows. There are many different ways of defining operating, but it is quite a loose term. The next question is, are they a growing business? Because businesses that don't have a growth mindset typically aren't too concerned about state and local tax strategies because typically they're doing the bare minimum just to get by. So we like to ask them if they're growing. And then the third question is, do they have a state and local tax strategy? People have CPAs who are excellent at what they do, and they often also have compliance software tools that help them with their state and local tax need. And I'm sure uh, many of you uh, on today's presentation are well aware of the various uh, softwares that are available. But most of the time they say that's about it. And that's where we come into the picture and that's what we wanna help you guys understand today to talk about the SALT strategy. So who's monitoring what it is that you're supposed to be doing, the changes in the legislation, the different thresholds, the different definitions. Sometimes the requirement to collect sales tax from a customer comes down to the wording of an invoice. So it is such a nuanced topic that there, and there is such an uptake and interest in it and to the point of COVID, COVID, there was quite a few moratoriums on the various state and local taxes that were uh, that businesses, that the governments, the state authorities would collect from businesses. So they stopped those and now they're looking to recoup their revenue. So these nexus questionnaires and various uh, state driven uh, state audits, tax audits are coming to many different businesses and people don't know what to do. So what we want to help do today is demystify some of the concepts of state and local taxes so you can recognize these ideas as well and you know provide some some more guidance to your you know to your multi-state businesses so i'm going to go ahead and get started i do know we have uh, a, a few different polls as well uh but to just to cover the clear agenda for today we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, physical and economic nexus in 2018 there was a supreme court ruling with uh, wafer uh, wafer versus south dakota and we're going to talk about the definitions of physical and economic nexus and what, a, what nexus actually is. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about entity and corporate structures and how that impacts business income tax. We're going to talk about sales and use tax for businesses operating across multiple st across state lines. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the best practices for, for maintaining the account uh, accurate state, and, uh, state tax filing footprint because it's one thing to sort of clean it up and get it right but you also do need to create an ongoing strategy to make sure that you're compliant as a business. A business needs to make sure it's compliant going forward. In fact, a lot of the things that you can do to rectify the issues that have that have uh, uh, arisen in the past is by ensuring 
that you maintain accurate records and making sure that you keep things in best practice. So to get started, we're going to uh, launch this poll and, and, and Maggie, I might hand it back to you to sort of uh, navigate this one. All right, so our first right, poll so is live. It should be live on everyone's screen now. You're gonna to respond to these polls by clicking the radio button that corresponds to your answer. And please be sure to click submit to register your response. This is poll number one of five, and we'll leave this open for about a minute. The question is, what is your level of expertise in providing state and local tax services? We really just want to understand who's our audience, how much do you guys know about SALT, and um, it'll help us guide where we should be focusing the emphasis here on our, our conversation today. All, All right, right, Maggie, I'm sure you can see the results. I'm about to close down this first poll in three, two, one, and I'll share those results on screen. Back to you. It's okay, looking thank like you. a lot of you are in the, the right spot today. 49% provide no, no specialized salt services, 30% some, and then 16% also some. And we have a couple experts, 5% are experts. Yeah, so I would say uh, to the experts, um, please feel free to uh, um, uh, view today as a refresher. And uh, I'm sure we're, I apologize for telling you some things that you might already know. For those who are not specialized in salt services, and I would say it appears that just, just under half of you provide no specialized salt services. And if any of you have multi-state clients, businesses operating across multiple state lines, this is of great relevance to you. Because if you're not providing some salt income tax services, or you're not using tax consultants to assist you in doing so, then there, this is a big, as I said, it's the up and coming area of public accounting. It is the hottest area. So, so many of you here today, there's gonna to be a lot of information out here that is gonna be very relevant to your customers and to your clients. And by all means, we welcome conversations afterwards. We're very happy to provide ongoing assistance. So hopefully today will just be a taste or like I like to say, a dash of salt. But uh, thank you all for providing your answers and, and let's, uh, uh, let's progress then. So the big question is what is Nexus? It's a term that's used across uh, the state and local tax world. And the way I like to define it is it refers to connection, right? If you have nexus with a state, it means you have sufficient connections with that state to be, um, uh, you have sufficient connections with that state to be required to deal with a certain state tax. Now, what I, I guess to, to run through the details of the slides, it's applicable when you're dealing with any sort of state tax that a business that is either local or out of state, but operating in that state is required to pay. So there has to be a connection and that level of connection is exactly what shows, what demonstrates what you are required to do. Now these rules, as you can imagine, these rules and these rules and regulations work on a very granular level in the US. So if you have a certain number of transactions, for instance, in some states, and we do provide some examples today, but if you have a certain number of transactions, you could have, be considered to have nexus with the state. You can have sales tax nexus, you can have income tax nexus. So you could be operating on the other side of the country, but because you have some, you have what the government or that state authority refers to as nexus, sufficient connection with that state, you are required to collect sales tax, in that state on behalf of your customers and remit it to the state. And you may be required to pay state income tax. You may be even required to withhold employment tax from those, uh, from various employees, et cetera. So when it comes down to it, the definition of nexus and whether you can, be, whether you're determined to have nexus is something that's governed by the constitution. So therefore most of this, 
most of the rhetoric and most of the material that you'll read online and that you might have heard about ultimately comes down from the Supreme Court, which is why the Wayfair ruling is such a land, landmark case because it was a it was a ruling from the Supreme Court. But it also does boil down to other, you know, local court level, uh, lower court levels, etc. Now, the thing is, Congress has limited power, but it does have the power to pass legislation and address the conformity issues to try and make sure that the states are required to follow along with what the federal government requires. But unfortunately, there is, as I said, the, the power that the state holds is quite limited in this area. So what ends up happening is it ultimately creates additional administ administrative burdens on many different companies because whether, they're, whether their state does conform to the tax law, to the federal law, whether it doesn't, we see this exist in many areas, not just state and local taxes, but I'll give you an example. Uh, Leighton as a business assists businesses with the R&D tax credit, which exists on a federal level and a state level, yet not every single um, state conforms with the federal laws. There are also other tax credits or other tax issues that the federal government sort of has to try and streamline the compliance, but that legislation is limited and it hasn't gained much traction to, to simplify the, uh, the, requirement, the requirement for state income tax purposes and other state and local taxes. So it's an extremely, extremely difficult place to navigate because if you do have nexus and you are operating in multiple states, which, which, which you have determined nexus, all of a sudden you have to be an expert in all these different state and, ta state and, and local taxes in order to get it right. And it, the onus is on the taxpayer to get it right. So if you get it wrong, that's when you're looking at fees, looking at penalties, you're looking at interest, et cetera. So really, really important to understand what nexus means and also understand how it relates to a multi-state business. Now, when considering, we said that it all ultimately stems from the US constitution. So in order for nexus to be determined and for it to be actually in existence, there it's required to, for there both to be the due process and commerce clauses of the constitution. You need to be meeting the criteria for those, for those particular clauses to be satisfied. What are those clauses? So we've got them here highlighted in yellow. The due process clause is that requires some definite link, as you can see, very ambiguous, requires some definite link, some minimum connection between a state and the person, property or transaction it seeks, it seeks to tax. So that was defined in the Miller Bros versus uh, uh, Co versus Maryland. And um, the uh, and, and the other uh, consideration is that the income attributed to the state for tax purposes needs to be rationally related to the values connected with the taxing state, which is a, a Mormon manufacturing company versus Bear. So as you can see here, the constitutional, the, the definition of nexus, so if you go back to this previous slide, understanding what nexus is really boils down to these constitutional considerations. However, as you can see, there's no, defin there's no definite uh, definition here. It's all very ambiguous. So each state and each circumstance starts to become its own set of rules, its own set of circumstances, and almost subjective in its own right. So the Commerce Clause, which after covering the Due Process Clause, as we can see, that defines the connection and link. This, uh, the, the, common clause, the Commerce Clause requires for there to be what it refers to as substantial presence, right? So, and this is a big, this word presence has been the cause of much contention over uh, the last, I would say, 30 years, I think since the early 90s, and perhaps even uh, preceding that. But there needs to be what, what, what the Constitution refers to as substantial presence, which was defined in the, in, in, with, with the current terminology. It's the court held in that particular case that an out-of-state business would unduly burden interstate commerce and added that using a uh, a, a physical presence standard under this, uh, under which states could only require business such as uh, such presence in the state encourages settled expectations and in doing so uh, fosters investment by businesses and individuals. So as you can see, whether it be the due process clause or the substantial presence clause, there does need to be a sufficient connection. And that connection, once it's met, 
once those constitutional considerations are met, that's when we have to start unpacking the specifics from a state by state basis. Some are very simple and some tend to become quite complex. So I guess probably the two most common terms when you hear the words state and local tax are, as we talked about in the previous slides, presence and nexus. And there's a big difference between physical presence, where you are physically in a state, and economic nexus, which is maintaining a market or building a market in a state. And we're going to unpack these two definitions. I actually had a call with one of our clients recently who uh, they, they were in the, um, they're in the manufacturing business and they operate in all 50 states and uh, and DC. And he said, oh, I've got a lot of business everywhere and we sell uh, into all these states. And But we our offices are in Georgia. And uh, because we work in Atlanta, Georgia, that's the only place that we have an office. So we only worry about sales and use tax in Atlanta. Uh, we haven't ever worried about state and local taxes or sales tax in, um, in, in the other states. And I, I mean, I, as a consultant in this space, I almost fell off my chair because I, I, I couldn't believe it. Oh, he has a lot of revenue generating in all these different states and um, he had no idea about this concept. He said, what do you mean physical presence? So physical presence is one way to have nexus, but there is this whole other concept called economic nexus. And a lot of people weren't aware of this uh, since the, a, a very a big ruling that took place, which is the Wayfair ruling, which we keep on referring to, which puts economic nexus as a relevant factor to determining nexus when it comes to uh, when it comes to sales and use tax. So we're going to talk about each of these terms so you can start to understand what your clients who are operating in multiple states, whether they meet one or the other. And we can also talk about which of the two is superior and we can talk about how to identify and which thresholds exist, etc. So what does physical presence actually mean? And by knowing the term physical presence, you're already on the way to becoming a state and local tax expert. But Physical presence, which was actually, um, um, it was sort of defined in 1992, so there you go, 30 years ago, it essentially comes down to having a uh, having an actual um, sort of something going on in the state that you're selling into. So whether it be you've got offices, property, and property in the, in the tax world is referred to real uh, or tangible personal property, such as inventory. So if you're storing, you've got warehouses, if you've got employees or 1099s, if you've got people traveling uh, to sell or people traveling in very, in very often cases, traveling for trade shows, uh, remote workers, telecommuters, that is the definition of, uh, of um, having a physical presence. So if you meet these criteria, and of course, these are, you know, just because you have an office doesn't necessarily mean you are, you have a physical presence, but generally speaking, that's the rule of thumb. There are some nuances there. But if you have that, you therefore are considered to have a physical presence in the state. Now, economic nexus, what does that refer to? So in 2018, this Supreme Court ruling, which is, which is quoted and spoken about, you know, uh, in every single state and local tax conversation, it eliminated the requirement for physical presence when it came to, state and, when it came to sales tax uh, uh, in the Commerce Clause. So if we go back to understanding what the Commerce Clause said, it required for there to be a, a presence there and it said that physical presence uh, uh, it was no longer the standard for creating nexus instead it was now an economic nexus having a market having transactions having revenue generating revenue and what was interesting about Wayfair which I'm sure many of you know if not all of you know Wayfair is an online furniture uh, retailer that uh, an e-commerce business that sells furniture across the country and generates millions of dollars in, 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 in each state and it's, it's a massive company. And what happened was Wayfair was doing, was undertaking all this online retail activity. And this is what sparked the controversy is just because they weren't maintaining a physical presence in any of these places that they were selling into. It now became something of a conversation topic where now if you're selling into them and you've got enough revenue and what does enough revenue mean? Well, that's, on the, that, that, that's down to the states. But economic nexus became a thing for sale for the, for the collection of sales and use tax. It was already a thing um, previously for state income tax. 
So 2018 really was only looking at sales and use tax, but it did have a strong impact on, on uh, income tax as well, which we, which we might speak about a little later on. But understanding these two forms, and, and I believe the next sort of, uh, the, the, the next thing to tackle, the next topic to unpack is, so like, what is it exactly that determines an economic nexus? So what it, so South Dakota, which was, which the court case was against with Wayfair, they passed the legislation that essentially said that a, a company like Wayfair that has no physical presence in the state could create a sales and use tax nexus if they had $100,000 in revenue, which is the benchmark for many different states now, or 200 or more separate transactions within South Dakota customers. So as you can see, economic nexus wasn't only about, I guess the takeaway from these two options is, it's about maintaining a market. So if you've got enough going on in a market, and according to South Dakota, enough going on was considered 200 transactions or $100,000 in generated revenue. If you meet those criteria, you now are considered to have an economic nexus. And of course, Wayfair would meet that criteria and therefore they have a nexus. And therefore, South Dakota wanted to collect a sales tax on their purchases, on, on their sales, sorry. So essentially it introduced this whole new topic and it really shook things up for the e-commerce world. Because as you can imagine, the whole benefit of e-commerce is the elimination of bricks and mortar and being able to go out and be able to sell um, uh, across the country and across the globe. And now we've got our, uh, our first true or false question. And Maggie, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you. All right, everybody. The most recent Supreme Court case to weigh in on state tax nexus was in 1992. True or false? You could only pick one. Oh, it looks like false is, is trending. All right, this is poll number two on your screen now. Got about 30 seconds remaining. If you're having any issues with these polls, please refresh your browser. Every time we do these, I say I'm gonna bring music. I never do. <laughs> Well, we're going to go ahead and shut down the second poll in three, two, one, and sharing those results on screen. Back to you. Okay, All thank right. you very much for that. Maggie? So what's, what's the answer, Ben? Go to the next slide. The answer is, like many of you said, false. In 1992, of you are, are listening. I, are listening correct in 1992 there was a case that was discussing income tax nexus and whether economic nexus was relevant to that it was in 2018 that we were um we had the wayfair case and that was what really shook up when it came to state tax nexus the whole concept of state tax nexus was uh shaken up in 2018 so um and since then of course there have been many it hasn't reached the supreme court but there have been many many questions and court cases and things to sort of determine what nexus actually means. But well done to the 71% of you who, um, who got that right and for the 29 who didn't, I hope now you know that it's a very recent talking point in the last few years. So which one is the superior? You know, if I had a physical presence or an economic nexus. So I think the one thing to always remember is physical presence trumps economic nexus. If you That was always the underlying condition of having a state tax nexus. So if you, it, so and, and as we've said here on this slide, it's very much the, just the determining factor, the first factor. So economic nexus only really kicks in when you have no physical presence. So the second that there is an employee, the second that there is inventory, or the second that there's an office or anything like that, that that is considered to be physical, you are considered to have nexus. Of course, that has to be measured, but we don't even think about economic nexus. If you don't, that's when we start measuring and we start understanding what the state expects, etc. 
It's also important to keep in mind that Wayfair was sort of the culmination of a lot of, uh, and, and this is how the Supreme Court works, right? There's a, there's sort of a, 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 it was a calm it was a culmination and accumulation of many different sort of cases that were chipping away at the whole concept of physical presence being the only way to measure because obviously e-commerce didn't start in 2018 and the reasons why uh, states would be very interested in collecting sales tax on out-of-state companies who are selling into the state uh, that, that that was something that was you know the definition was always as you saw in the commerce clause it's very clearly uh, physical, right? As in that, that was the status quo. However, in a long way up to the status quo, there were many different court cases. There were many different discussions that led to eventually negating the whole thing as only being physical presence and opening up this concept as of, of economic nexus. So for instance, the whole concept of click-through nexus legislation. Click-through ne uh, click Nexus le legislation was sort of a whole concept of a remote seller meaning uh, being required to meet a certain threshold of activities through an in-state referral agent. So essentially what you were doing is you were using an agent in the state, but you were operating out of the state. And that was increasing in traction, as you can definitely understand in the sales world when you're selling products or services. And, and of course, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, sales tax can be very can be very relevant to, um, uh, to to intangible property as well, and to um, services that are being rendered. But essentially, click through services were the beginning, or, or one of the things that sort of take started chipping away at this whole concept of physical nexus. The second that all of a sudden this business is not in the particular state, yet it's figuring out a way to sell into the state, is there a requirement to pay? Uh, to, to collect sales tax on this uh, upon sale of the service or product. Well, this clicking through uh, uh, sort of rule was one of the first steps that ultimately led us to creating this concept of economic nexus. So it just shows you how there was a journey to get to this place. But physical presence obviously is what the basis was. And slowly but surely we moved away from that to get to a point where now economic nexus is a serious factor. However, just to, again, to reiterate, physical presence is the dominating factor as well, uh, out of the two. Now, it wasn't just a click-through. So additionally, outside of these other ones, states would pass what, what was referred to as affiliate nexus legislation, which essentially uh, meant that somebody who was selling products or services um, who was not in the state, so they were operating remotely, and th they were either owned by or held a substantial interest by an in-state retailer. And again, this is this is becoming more and more common as time went by. All of a sudden, these states started passing these laws to play around with the term nexus or, or presence and say physical presence can be determined in various ways, even if there isn't an actual, the actual beneficiary isn't actually physically in the state. So uh, this, this started to sort of change the rules once again, common ownership wasn't always required and some activities weren't included. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a sort of a full throttle concept of economic nexus taking precedence or, or, or not, sorry, not taking precedence, but being substantial. It was a, a journey. So as we said, click through, and then affiliate nexus legislation, all of these different steps essentially started changing the definition of what nexus actually means until this concept of economic nexus was introduced. So when we're looking at a business today, a multi-state business, we understand now that there are ever since Wayfair, especially, it's not just about physical, it's not just about physical presence. You do not have to have a bricks and mortar store. You do not have to have employees in a state. As long as you have sufficient economic connections to the state, even without a physical presence, you can still be required to collect sales tax. And the same applies for state income tax uh, as well. And that's a, a, that's an older law that we can that, that we can draw from from 1992. But so, what does it mean practically today? So, the Supreme Court considered when it was deciding between Wayfair and South Dakota with this whole concept of well, Wayfair isn't in the state. Why is it? 
required to collect sales taxes. So it thought that the Supreme Court wanted to sort of now create this new streamlined rule. They came and they said, we now want to stay across the country, across all the states. There is now a uniform sort of way of going about it, that there will be a threshold which you will meet when it comes to transactions or when it comes to revenue, uh, $200,000 in revenue and one, uh, um, uh, sorry, $100,000 in revenue and 200 transactions. And that will uh, ensure that you meet the criteria for economic nexus, even without a physical presence. And it'll be happy days, everyone will follow. <laughs> well, unfortunately, there are arguments that for a vast majority of businesses, or I will say for a, a huge number of businesses, it has turned out the opposite. The administrative burden that has been created as a result of the thresholds that are varying from state to state, it has created a huge burden for these businesses because now they're not just worrying about, we always like to say it, Leighton, if you're dealing with federal tax as a CPA, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's so complex. United States tax law, I don't have to tell any of you, it is a very complex space, but there's one IRS. Imagine having to work with 50 different IRSs and then considering the different tax rates. I mean, when you boil down to property tax, how property tax rates vary on a, on a neighborhood, sometimes street by street basis. So when you're looking at state and local taxes, but just talking about purely from an economic nexus perspective, the different states started putting in different thresholds and it started to become a big mess. And that's exactly where businesses are struggling today with state and local taxes. And these weren't factors in, in, for, for many of these businesses prior to 2018. And what's really interesting is that almost every single state, I think we're down to the last state that is about to sort of conform and start being required to uh, collect, to conform to what the legislation or what the constitutional definition of uh, presence is, that it also refers to economic nexus. Now it's across the entire country. So everybody has it. It's just the question is, what are the transactions? South Dakota decided $100,000 in revenue, 200 transactions. Now we have many different factors as well. So if we're deep, we're diving deep, you've got one, the increase of internet access in, and use in 26 years when physical presence was the controlling factor. It doesn't consider the explosion of e-commerce. So states wanting to require out-of-state sellers to collect sales tax on in-state sales realized the amount of revenue that they could actually generate if there was no physical presence. And the third sort of topic or, or, or argument is states wanted to capture revenue from the major players in e-commerce and challenging the physical presence standard was the avenue to do so. So this was a very state-driven strategy. What they wanted to do is they wanted to essentially adapt to the, law, the laws of old to the explosion of e-commerce ever since physical presence was no longer something that was necessarily required in income tax, et cetera, income state tax. And they also wanted to be able to generate billions of revenue for their state. And they thought they were legitimately entitled to that. And therefore they were working on that. And also the e-commerce players, they would operate in one state, but everyone wanted their share of the, of, of the pie as well. So essentially, the uh, states were driving to create this new concept of economic nexus, and that's how sales tax nexus today has sort of formed into including economic nexus. So what state laws pass the Wayfair test? So this is a checklist provided by the Supreme Court that lists the factors in South Dakota's law and why it is now considered constitutional. So what are these laws? So the first law is no retroactive, or, or sort of this, this, this checklist is no retroactive collection prior to the time the law was enacted. That's, a, that's the first and foremost. The second one is single state level administration of all sales tax in the state. A safe harbor to exclude companies with only limited business in South Dakota. Uniform definitions of products and services simplified tax rate structure, access to sales tax administration software provided by the state, and immunity for sellers who use the software as they are not liable for errors derived from relying on it. So if you are a state that has these criteria, now that means that you 
essentially fall under the category of South Dakota in this instance, and then you're able to bring out this constitutional right of economic nexus. What you do with that and how you define it is the next discussion, but you have to meet these criteria, you have to meet this checklist in order to consider it, for it to be considered constitutional. Now, the big question is what are the actual uh, thresholds? So as, as of today, there, uh, oh, and, and this is what, what I was mentioning before, all states, all states that impose sales tax have passed an economic threshold and are active, except Missouri, which is going to be enforced in 2023, that's the final state. Now, these rules and these thresholds continue to change. They are always in flux, but these are some examples of how you can sort of see the variability when it comes to uh, when it comes to whether your state is required. So California, for instance, half a million dollars in revenue, you've got economic presence. Florida, 100,000. Georgia, not only 100,000, but it could be 200 or more sales. And there's variability in all these definitions, even revenue itself doesn't necessarily mean a dollar from a customer to you. Sometimes there are changes when it comes to who the customer is or how the customer operates or what the product is that you're selling, is it taxable, et cetera. Then you've got New York, which is $500,000 in sales of tangible personal property and more than 100 sales. So as you can see, just in these few states, there are varying definitions. So when you're talking about thresholds, those are the figures. But when we actually start to unpack these thresholds, we have to understand what is included in order to calculate the revenue number or the transaction number. So this is a further layer of complication in determining exactly what it means that the sale of tangible property and taxable services are included in determining whether a threshold is met. So some states look at the sale of tangible personal property, including exempt sales to calculate the threshold. So even if you are selling things that aren't actually taxable. So they're exempt if you're selling to a 501c3 who has an exemption certificate. I mean, there are many different examples, but essentially you could be including those sales to meet the economic factor, yet others sort of say, no, they have to sort of meet that, uh, they can't be sales tax exempt or, or, or sort of exempt uh, organizations. So there is variability in, in, in that definition. And the next one is, if you wanna add a, a further layer of complexity to all of this, there's the marketplace facilitator law, where what happens is it shifts the sales and use tax collection and remittance obligations to a middleman, to a marketplace, whether it be the likes of an Amazon or an Etsy, where essentially these people are selling other people's products or services. So most states have addressed whether these sales models are sort of, um, are considered to be included in this process of, of reaching the threshold. So it's ordered and always really important to understand sort of the state and where it stands on the multi, uh, the marketplace facilitator rule. And that is something that strongly impacts reaching the threshold, thinking about the Amazon type organizations, if they've got sort of e-commerce, but they're a facilitator and there's no facilitator rule there, uh, marketplace facilitator rule, well, that's something that will heavily impact whether or not they are required to collect sales tax or income tax to pay income tax, et cetera. So this multi-state uh, marketplace facilitator rule is really important when it comes to determining whether somebody or a company has an economic nexus. Now we're up to our next uh, little true and false. And Maggie, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much. All right, well, speaking of uh, marketplace facil facilitators, our third poll question is, if a company sells through a marketplace facilitator, there is never an obligation for the company to register and collect state, collect sales tax in a state. Is this true or false? All right, I see the answers coming through. 72% of the people have voted. A lot of them are correct. I've got the answer in my hand. Oh, it's on my cell phone, I'm holding it. We're oh, almost at we full voting. Oh, sorry, yeah, Jasmine. Right. No worries, no worries. Gonna say we're about to do the big reveal. I'm gonna go ahead and shut this one down in three, two, and one. 
Back over the to you. Big reveal. <laughs> well, 81% of you were correct. The answer is false. It is. is. That's right. So as we were just, as so there is sometimes an obligation. What it comes down to is whether or not there is a marketplace facilitator law in place, which requires them to register and collect sales tax in that state. So as we alluded to just now, and as the people have spoken and 81% of you agree, you do you are required in certain circumstances to collect sales tax and register in the state if you are a marketplace facilitator. And that's a really important point when it comes to uh, Wayfair and when it comes to e-commerce and, and, and marketplaces in general. Ben, I just wanted so to again, highlight, yeah, we're, sure. about, we're about halfway through the slides and we've got 15 minutes remaining. So perhaps for the end, we focus on the, the most important aspects of the remaining slides. Absolutely, yes. Keeping a close eye on the time and I wanna make sure that we can cover as much as we can. So as Thank you can you. see here, Massachusetts, Florida, Nevada, there are different definitions. And uh, because all of you are going to be receiving this um, um, this presentation as well as a takeaway uh, after today, you'll be able to refer back and this is in no way exhaustive, but these are just examples of the various rules that are in place and the, and the differences. So then as we sort of walk through here, what are sort of the best practices in order to ensure that you're keeping up with the, uh, the, the, your, the definition of nexus? So the first thing is you need to work with a salt specialist who's up to date. Now, in the beginning of today's discussion, the major of the vast majority of you either provide no specialized state and local tax services or provide very limited state and local tax services. Only 5% of you were considered to be, considered themselves as experts. As you can imagine, it's not common to have a business that's working together with a, with a provider that is a specialist in this area. So that's really important because they keep us as specialists, people like who are specialists, keep, keep up to date with this kind of stuff. Now, the other thing as well is you need to connect the salt specialist with the automated service. So let's say there's an Avalara or there's a Vertex or there's a tax jar, or there is a service that the business is using. You want the salt specialist to be liaising with them. And not only that, you want them to be liaising with the CPA because it makes the CPA who focuses on compliance, the, 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 the automation software that focuses on compliance to make sure that they are actually in compliance through the consulting practices of the salt specialist. For any clients that are working in M&A, another best practice is to make sure that they know whether there's any exposure with the company that they're either connecting with or purchasing. Really important. We know that in many cases, business is going through a merger or an acquisition. If there's a due diligence process that takes place and SALT hasn't been dealt with, if standard local tax is not tidy, that deal can die. So it's really important for best practice to keep an eye on the prospective sale, the company that you're looking to purchase or merge with. And essentially sales tax, if it's being done correctly, there should never be sales tax coming out of the business's revenue. They should always be making sure that you that, that they are collecting it at the point of sale and making sure that they are uh, paying at, are remitting it to the state correctly. This is a great way to segue into the concept of a nexus study, which is uh, for you to get a, a business to get a determination about each and every state as to whether or not they should be collecting sales taxes in that state, whether they should be paying income taxes in that state, and whether or not they're doing it correctly. And if they're not, and we find that more than 50% of businesses that are currently oper operating across multiple states get it wrong, then they should be aware of that because if they're doing it wrong, there could be unpaid taxes payable, penalties payable, et cetera. Now, um, essentially, when it comes to income tax nexus, because we've been focusing a lot on sales tax nexus, we, I just want to speak a little bit about today how income tax nexus works. So many state income taxes um, are sort of, once again, broadly defined, and they're sort of connected to if you're doing business or deriving income in the state, then you're required to, uh, to, to, to pay um, uh, business income tax. So the question is, what are the definitions of doing businesses uh, and deriving income? So here we have a point where we say unless there is protection from the filing requirement, either by the due process or the commerce clauses, as we spoke about uh, from the um, from the constitution, or there is a de minimis 
threshold. States typically take the position that out-of-state companies, um, that the out-of-state company is required to pay income tax to the state. Now, further to this point, as we go back uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, one of the state Supreme Court cases held that physical presence was not required for state income tax. And that's what we were saying before, how it wasn't a new concept, it was just a concept introduced to sales tax. So this was something in 1993 where it was actually introduced. So in Jeffrey versus uh, um, um, South Carolina Tax Commission, the South Carolina Supreme Court essentially held that the presence of intangible property alone in a state is sufficient to establish nexus. And then this was uh, a challenge to the US Supreme Court, but the court declined to hear the case, essentially upholding what the uh, South Carolina Supreme Court held. So as you can see, very similar sort of idea to where the journey headed with sales tax, but income tax was already very relevant too. Now, post Wayfair is quite interesting. How did Wayfair impact income tax? So the concept of economic nexus has been around for income tax since 1992, 1993. Many states limited the use of two types of, well, they were sort of limited to two types of taxpayers, the related party uh, intangible holding companies or credit card banks. However, now that economic nexus has been allowed for sales tax purposes, states are also able to expand their challenges and reach the out-of-state companies with a significant in-state in market. So it used to be very limited in scope to be able to pull this economic nexus concept in income tax. But now that economic nexus is allowed for sales tax purposes, once again, it changes the game and the states are now able to do very, very, they're able to start to become more flexible when it comes to this kind of stuff. Now, the the whole the sort of the whole MTC concept is another very relevant concept when it comes to income tax nexus. So the Multi Tax Commission developed a a model state tax statute called Factor Presence. So essentially determining a, a bright line rule that determines significant presence in a in 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 a statute sufficient to impose the state's income tax through either physical presence or economic nexus, where, whether it be payroll or property, or whether it be sales. So here's an example of how you can reach sort of the multi-state commis tax commission uh, uh, factor presence. It's $50,000 of property. And when we say property, we're talking about property as in uh, not only um, uh, real property, but also tangible property, et cetera. $50,000 of either payroll or property, sales of half a million or 25% or more of total property or total sales meets the criteria for the MTC regulations. And now for our next poll. Thank I you. Pull up on screen now. Poll number four. Which ways can economic nexus be created for income tax purposes in a state? This one is not true or false. So question A or answer A. A dollar amount of sales or receipts sourced to a state. B, through a broadly written doing business statute. And C, either A or B. It looks like the group is leaning towards answer C, either A or B. We've got about 70%, 30% remaining. So get y'all answers in. All right, looking good. I'll go ahead and shut this one down pretty soon. In three, two, two one. one. And there you have it. Excellent. Well, as many of you did say, it can be either or. A dollar amount or through a broadly written doing business statute. And that is the fun of state and local taxes. It is something that is so broad and is something that is so loosely defined that yes, you might not reach the, set, um, uh, the required revenue or the required amount of sales, yet you could still be considered doing business. These are things that are, uh, are, are as ambiguous as they sound. So it can be one of, one of either. We got a pretty smart group here. We Maybe do. We it's, think about it, it right. I'm not sure I believe anyone when they say that only 5% of you are salt experts. You seem to be all pretty switched on when it comes to this stuff. <laughs>
So business income tax examples, thinking about the fact of presence. So let's say, for example, a, bi a business has taken the multi-state multi tax commission factors as written, uh, then they'll obviously, uh, you know, it will be more straightforward, but others sort of have a variation of it. So for example, Connecticut uses a bright line threshold just for receipts in state of a half a million, but does not include property. So they've sort of taken a, a, a portion of the MTC. States that impose business taxes other than traditional income tax, so whether it be the Ohio commercial activities or the Washington business occupation tax, use all or part of these MTC uh, factors. So like the Washington business and operation tax is sort of, it takes basically the 50,000, 50,000, a quarter of a million or 25%. So it really does, some, some of them take all of it, some of them take parts of it, it really depends. And again, adding to all the complexities. Now, another important thing to consider is sourcing when it comes to this. And I am wary that we're starting to run out of time. So <coughs> briefly, where you're sourcing from can have a major impact on your requirement to, to, uh, to pay income tax. So you have to be uh, moving towards using market-based sourcing for years where receipts are portioned to states based on where tangible property is delivered or where the benefit of the services is received. So that's the first one of the considerations. And the second one is when you're calculating the apportionment for each day, it's really important to make sure that you're aware exactly the numerator that needs to go into the formula for the state in the market-based states. So where was the benefit received? So location-wise, is it a customer location? You know, where was the benefit taken? Where were the services performed? These are things that are really, really practical. So you're delivering things, where was the benefit taken? Who's receiving the benefit? What is the benefit? And, and this can happen across multiple states. So really important to consider all of those things when you've got uh, multi-state activities and considering income tax requirements. So in order to mitigate the administrative burden on multi-state businesses, the government, the federal government passed a law and this is PL 86-272. Specifically, the law prohibits states from imposing a net income tax on income derived from an interstate commerce, from interstate commerce, if the business activity was with if the business was within the state when these three conditions were satisfied. The first condition is only activity within the state consists of soliciting sales of tangible personal property. The, the second one is uh, um, these sales are approved by the Home Office outside of the customer state and thirdly the tangible personal property is shipped to the customer from outside the state now just some additional points to briefly mention the law was unaffected by wayfair so in terms of the federal law it didn't change at all so you are there is protection for being required to collect sales tax in these three instances uh, sales of services and digital products are usually not covered it does not apply to non-income taxes and some of these minimum taxes uh, range from $500 to $2,000 might seem small, but if you've had many years of exposure, it can add up quite significantly, all of a sudden tens of thousands of dollars, which can be quite common. And uh, for our next poll, I'll hand it back to you, Maggie. Thank you. This is our final polling question. Bear with us, guys. We've got two minutes. Which of the following statement, statements is incorrect regarding PL 86-2? Question A, or answer A, PL 86-272, protection protects against imposition of state income tax in limited circumstances. Protection does not generally apply to sales of services. C, states take a broad interpretation of PL 86-272, and it is easy for companies to claim the protection. D, companies are protected from the Texas margins tax under PL 86-272. That is a tricky question, you guys. So best of luck to you. It seems to be kind of an even split. I think this highlights the complexity of sales tax, this very question. This has been a very complicated topic. I'll go ahead and shut down this <laughs> fifth and final poll in five, four, three, two, one. And what's the final verdict, Mag Maggie? So you guys were 20. pretty well split. Sorry, go on. 
Maggie? I was going to say 26% of you got that one correct. The answer is C. States take a broad interpretation of PL 86-272, and it is easy for companies to, to claim the protection. Yes, yeah, so that is incorrect. As we stated earlier in these previous slides, um, it, it is quite... Yeah, it is quite, uh, um, yeah, it's quite uniform. So, um, all right, so moving along, I think we're going to, we, we should uh, be wrapping up. Uh, Maggie, how many slides do we have left? Um, I think we've got about 10. Okay, so very no. briefly then, I know we're, we're, we're sorry? There's three more that are important. We'll just skip the case study. Okay, excellent. So very, very briefly, just to sort of wrap things up here, um, nexus considerations of pass-through entities, which are very common entity structures. Most businesses, uh, uh, most state business income taxes are designed to address corporate income tax, and it becomes murky when you start, it becomes even murky when you're dealing with pass-through entities. So is passive income earned by a non-resident required to pay the state? That becomes very tricky, as you can imagine. And the multi-state tax commission is currently working on a model to sort of make this uh, uniform. And we've dropped the link here as well. Now, maintaining a clear SALT footprint is the next really important part, which is working with a SALT consultant to ensure that they add value and making sure that they're um, uh, giving you all the information you need and also work with the SALT consultant and specialist to clear up any past exposure. There's a concept called voluntary disclosure agreements which enable you to come clean with the state, often in a voluntary manner, pay back any taxes over the last few years, draw a line in the sand and start doing things correctly. The next one is if, client, if, the, if your client receives any type of nexus questionnaire from the, from the state, just connect them with a SALT specialist before responding because sometimes a simple answer on a state nexus questionnaire, which I'm sure any business of yours that is operating across multiple states is likely to receive if it hasn't already. If you answer the wrong thing, it turns into a full-blown audit very quickly. So before you answer that, connect them with someone who knows. And if your client is using a sales tax automation solution and the provider recommends registering and collecting the sales tax in many different states, don't go through the hassle without going through a nexus study. It's a red flag to register for one, kite, one type of tax and not register for the others. So you need to make sure if you've got if you've determined nexus for one tax type and not another, you have to make sure that it's very, very, very clear because they can ask questions and then you won't just be up for questions around one tax type. It can be across all different 